Transporting goods by rail always had one major flaw. The time-consuming process of bringing and fetching the shipment to and from the station, at least for companies not directly connected to the rail system. And with it the need of transferring the goods multiple times between different means of transportation. While in the 19th century this was simply a given and accepted fact. This changed with the advent of modern trucks and became a real problem for railway companies. Traditionally, cargo was transported loose or in wooden crates of all different shapes and sizes. As such, every piece had to be handled differently and great care had to be taken. Stacking of different goods was often impossible. Therefore, the process of loading and unloading was labor-intensive, time-consuming and usually happened multiple times mid-journey when the goods were brought to and fetched from the station by road. And while early on railways made different attempts trying to simplify the transfer of goods with standardized boxes, the external pressure for such developments wasn't too big, as there was simply no viable alternative to the railway anyway. This, however, suddenly changed in the 1920s and 30s, when the railway operators saw themselves confronted with an ever-increasing competition from the slowly but steadily maturing roadside fleet of modern trucks. By road it was possible to transport goods directly from sender to receiver, with no transfer midway necessary. It became obvious, something had to be done. The first step towards simplifying the process of transferring goods, as usual, was the use of standardized containers. With the so-called von Haus to Haus service, which translates to from house to house, or more freely, from door to door, as British railways would later call their version of a very similar service, the Deutsche Reichsbahn, the German National Railway, introduced such containers in different sizes. Some of them were even fitted with wheels to increase versatility. But since these containers were loaded on regular stake wagons, the loading, fastening, unloading, etc. was still a lengthy process, all but a large improvement over handling a dozen of individual smaller crates. The real breakthrough came in 1938, when the Dutch railways began testing a new system of standardized boxes, which the Deutsche Bundesbahn, the federal railway of West Germany, adapted in the 1950s, before it became a European standard. The new system was known by multiple names. In Germany, the new boxes were initially called Großbehälter, translating to large containers, to separate them from smaller crates. Internationally, however, they became known as PA containers. PA is short for the French porteur à manager, which simply describes them in the role as transportation utilities. And they featured one major advantage over all older attempts. The new boxes had a standardized way of fastening. Each corner was secured with a single screw thread. As such, they could be quickly and securely fixed to a wagon without any tying down necessary. Initially, the containers received an additional layer of fastening by diagonal straps. This, however, was soon found to be redundant and therefore dropped. To make moving the containers around easier, they were all fitted with four wheels each. Both the wheelbase and the gauge were standardized too, with 1950mm and 1400mm respectively. This means guide rails could be used to position the containers on the wagons. Combined with a similar overall size, these containers were all freely interchangeable, despite the many different kinds of containers that were developed over the years. Covered boxes, reefers, open containers, silos for cement, silos for fine grade bulk load like sand or chalk, tanks for gases, others for fuel, and a whole range of tanks for consumables like beer and milk. And as an additional plus to the interchangeability, while one would expect emptied containers had to be immediately returned to the railway, Usually this was not the case. The Deutsche Bundesbahn explicitly offered their customers to use these containers for storage also. To make the system complete, specialized trucks were used to carry the containers from the goods station to the customer and vice versa. After a turbulent phase of testing many different roadside designs, the Deutsche Bundesbahn settled on the advanced semi-trailers built by the manufacturer Ackermann, pulled by Magiro's Deutsch tractors with their iconic round bonnets. The semi-trailers were fitted with hydraulic ramps to enable quick loading, unloading and transferring of containers with only a minimum of manual handling required. Thus only one person was needed to drive and operate each truck. The hydraulic ramps could also be used to tilt the container for easy unloading of bulk goods. 
and while different generation of these trucks appeared over the years, the base functionality always remained the same. Combined with these trucks, the Deutsche Bundesbahn could now offer an all-round service that fetched the goods directly from the sender and delivered them directly to the destination, which due to the easy transfer onto wagons was also quick enough to compete with road haulers. While the first container wagons were rebuilt from worn-out wagons of much older origin, the first entirely new ones, like portrayed by my model, were built no later than in 1950. These wagons were hardly more than a frame, as the guiding rails for the containers were part of the crossbars of the wagon frames themselves. These first container wagons were also rather short and could only handle three containers, but quickly grew to carry four. The first wagons to carry four, however, were those rebuilt from fast-running stake wagons. Only around 150 of them were constructed, with the necessary rails and locking systems sunk into the bed. They are quite unique, as some of them were intended to still be able to be used as a regular stake of flat wagons when needed. So rather than removing the sideboards, they were simply folded down, and the removable stakes were kept in the baskets. In reality, however, the abundance of available regular stake wagons meant the option of using the rebuilt ones for other goods than containers was hardly ever used. And the final step in the evolution of PA container wagons were the types long enough for five containers. Technically speaking, however, these weren't even the largest. In the late 1950s, the Deutsche Bundesbahn started to permanently couple some of the wagons for three or four containers respectively into pairs totaling at six or even eight containers each. Rather than by the usual screw coupling, the two wagons were connected by one that was permanently fixed to both coupling hooks, making it impossible to separate the wagons in normal service. And there was a very good reason for this. Due to the containers of the PA system being rather small, customers with a low density load struggled to make full use of the 20 ton tariff as they reached the physical limitations of the space available way before the weight limit of 20 tons, making the PA system very uneconomic for them. By permanently coupling two wagons together on the other hand you get, from the standpoint of transportation fees, a single wagon with the same payload but twice as much space. Another interesting detail are the colors of these containers, especially as it's quite difficult to find reliable information on that topic, at least for the early years. It is quite clear, however, from early photographs, many of them promotional shots with sparkling clean containers, that initially the PA containers were painted silver with black lettering. Presumably because silver is a rather unforgiven color when it comes to grime and dirt, it was soon changed to stone gray. Before in 1968, the color was once again changed to pebble gray, which has a noticeable beige hint to it. That being said, repaints were only carried out when necessary, resulting in different paint schemes being around at the same time for many years. Sometimes you could even find different colors of paint on a single container, when only a partial repaint was necessary. And many containers never received the final paint scheme of pepper gray before being withdrawn at all. And then there are of course the usual exceptions, with tanks for consumables being made from stainless steel remaining unpainted, with the frames being painted in the respective silver or grey, as well as tank containers for dark liquids like fuel, which were painted entirely black. And when it comes to the privately owned containers, well, they could be found in all colors of the rainbow. When the 20 and 40 feet long maritime containers began to set foot, the PA containers, formerly known as Großbehälter, large containers, were now renamed to middle container, intermediate containers as the sea containers now became the large ones. As both systems coexisted for a while, the later 5 unit wagons for the PA system were designed in such a way that they could carry both the small PA containers as well as the large sea containers, either one with 40 feet length or two 20 feet containers, but were later off modified to only be able to carry sea containers. So you could say it ended exactly like it began. While the first wagons for the PA system were rebuilt of the old traditional system of handling goods, it ended with the final purpose-built wagons to be refitted for the succeeding system. And it is indeed with the advent of the succeeding maritime containers, which were in opposition to the PA system, not only internationally used, but also stackable, that the PA system saw a rapid decline with the numbers of containers shrinking drastically in the 1970s. Most of the customers using the system had by now switched to transporting the cargo by road all the way, or in the best case to sea containers, 
As such, there was hardly any need for the older system anymore, before in the late 1980s, the Deutsche Bundesbahn finally ended their von Haus zu Haus service. This, however, didn't result into the end for these containers, as they could still be frequently seen until the early 2000s. Customers without rail connection had to bring and fetch them from the station now, however, themselves. And a handful of containers made it even into the 2010s. And it is quite likely, a small number might still be around today. Luckily, a good number of wagons and containers found already a new home at Heritage Railways. Unfortunately, however, as it's a common issue with goods wagons, they usually don't receive a lot of attention, both by the casual visitors as well as enthusiasts alike, which explains why many of the preserved examples are in fairly bad condition. Not even to speak about the roadside vehicles, which regretfully almost entirely went extinct. While my knowledge here might be incomplete, and I sure hope it is, I am only aware of a single surviving Ackermann trailer being stored away. Quite a shame, considering there was such a common sight on West Germany's roads in the 1950s and 60s. Once so abundant, today largely forgotten, the PA containers, along with its counterparts in other countries, played a fundamental part in laying the foundation for modern containerized cargo handling. I hope you enjoyed this comprehensive look at the PA system. If you did, please consider liking this video and subscribe if you want to learn more about German railway history. See you next time!